This was brought to you by The Storyteller on YouTube and Facebook. The Lurking Ear by H.P. Lovecraft Dude, the passer in the storm Days after that hideous experience in the forest swathed mansion, I lay nervously exhausted in my hotel room at Leopard's Corners. I do not remember exactly how I managed to reach the motor car started and slip unobserved back to the village, for I retain no distinct impression save of wild arm titan trees, demonic mutterings of thunder, and coronian shadows athwart the low mounds that dotted and streaked the region. As I shivered and brooded on the casting of that brain-blasting shadow, I knew that I had at last cried out of the Earth's supreme orbs, one of those nameless blights of outer voids whose faint demon scratchings we sometimes hear on the farthest rims of space, yet from which our finite vision has given us a merciful immunity. The shadow I had seen I hardly dared to analyze or identify. Something had laid between me and the window that night. I shuddered whenever I could not cast off the instinct of to classify it. If it had only snarled or bayed or laughed titteringly, even that would have relieved the abysmal hideousness. But it was so silent. It had rested a heavy arm, armor, foreleg on my chest. It was organic, or had once been organic. Jan Martins, whose room I had invaded, was buried in the graveyard near the mansion. I must find Bennett and Toby if they lived. Where had it picked them and left me for the last? Drowsiness is so stifling, and dreams are so horrible. In a short time, I realized that I must tell my story to someone or break down completely. I had already decided not to abandon the quest for the lurking fear, for in my rash ignorance, it seemed to me that Uncertainty was worse than enlightenment, however terrible the latter might prove to be. Accordingly, I resolved in my mind that the best course to pursue, whom to select for my confidences, and how to track down the thing which had obliterated two men and cast a nightmare shadow. My chief acquaintances at Leffert's Corner had been the affable reporters of whom several remained to collect final echoes of the tragedy. It was from these I, that I determined to choose a colleague, and the more I reflected, the more my preference inclined towards one Arthur Munro, a dark, lean man of about 35, whose education, taste, intelligence, and temperament all seemed to mark him as one not bound to conventional, conventional ideas and experiences. On an afternoon in early September, 
Arthur Monroe listened to my story. I saw from the beginning that he was both interested and sympathetic. And when I had finished, he analyzed and discussed the thing with the greatest shrewdness and judgment. His advice, moreover, was eminently practical, for he recommended a postponement of operations at the Martens Mansion until we might become fortified with more detailed historic and geographical data. On his initiative, we combed the countryside for information regarding the terrible Martens family discovered a man who possessed a marvelously illuminating ancestral diary. We also talked at length with such of the mountain mongrels as had not fled from the terror and confusion to remoter slopes and arranged to proceed our culminating task the exhaustive and definitive examination of the mansion in the light of its detailed history with an equally exhausted and definitive examination of the spots associated with the various tragedies of squatter legend. The result of this examination were not at first very enlightening, though our tabulations of them seem to reveal a fairly significant trend, namely that the number of reported horrors was by far the greatest in areas either comparatively near the avoided house or connected with it by stretches of the morbidly overnourished forest. There were, it is true, exceptions indeed the war which had caught the world's ear had happened in a treeless space remote alike from the mansion any connecting woods. As to the nature and appearance of the lurking fear, nothing could be gained from the scared and witless shanty dwellers. In the same breath, they called it a snake and a giant, a thunder devil and a bat, a vulture and a walking tree. We did, however, deem ourselves justified in assuming that it was a living organism, highly susceptible to electrical storms, and although certain of the stories suggested wings, we believe that its aversion for open spaces made land motion a more probable theory. The only thing incompatible with the latter view was the rapid rap, rapidity with which the creature must have traveled to perform all the deeds attributed to it. When we came to know the squatters better, we found them curiously likable in many ways. Some animals they were gently descending the evolutionary scale because of their unfortunate ancestry and stultifying isolation. They feared outsiders but slowly grew accustomed to us, finally helping vastly when we beat down all the thickets and tore out all the partitions.
conditions of the mansion in our search for the lurking fear. When we asked them to help us find Bennett and Toby, they were truly distressed. They wanted to help us, yet knew that these victims had gone as wholly out of the world as their missing people. The great numbers of them had been killed and removed just as the wild animals had long been exterminated. We were, of course, thoroughly convinced and we waited apprehensively for further tragedies to occur. By the middle of October, we were puzzled by our lack of progress. Owing to the clear nights, no demoniac aggressions had taken place. In the completeness of our vain searches of House and country almost drove us to regard the lurking fear as a non-material agency. We feared that the cold weather would come on and halt our explorations. We all agreed that the demon was generally quiet in winter. Thus, there was a kind of haste desperation in our last daylight canvas of the whore visited Hamlet. A Hamlet now deserted because of the squatter's fears. The ill-fated squatter Hamlet had borne no name but had long stood in a shelter, though treeless cleft between two elevations called respectively Cone Mountain and Maple Hill. It was closer to Maple Hill than to Cone Mountain. Some of the crude abodes indeed being dugouts on the side of the former eminence. Geographically, it lay about two miles northwest of the base of Tempest Mountain and three miles from the Oak Burt Mansion. Of the distance between the hamlet and the mansion, fully two miles and a quarter on the hamlet's side was entirely open. Country. The plain being of fairly level character, save for some of the low snake-like mounds, and having as vegetation, vegetation only grass and scattered weeds. Considering this topography, we had finally concluded that the demon must have come by way of Cone Mountain the wooden southern prolongation of which ran to within a short distance of the westernmost spur of Tempest Mountain. Tempest Mountain. The upheaval of ground we trace conclusively to a landslide from Maple Hill. A tall, lone, splintered tree on whose side had been the striking point of the thunderbolt which summoned the fiend. As for the twentieth time or more, Arthur Monroe and I went minutely over every inch of the violated village. We were filled with a certain discouragement coupled with a vague and novel fears. It was acutely uncanny even when frightful and uncanny things were common to encounter so blankly clueless a scene after such overwhelming occurrences. When we moved about beneath the leaden darkened sky 
with that tragic directionless zeal which results from a combined sense of futility and necessity of action. Her care was gravely minute. Every cottage was again entered, every hillside dug out again, searched for bodies, every thorny foot of adjacent slope again scanned for bins and caves, but all went without results. And yet, as I've said, vague new fears hovered menacing, menacingly over us, as if giant bat-winged griffins squatted invisibly on the mountaintops and leered with abandoned eyes that had looked on transcosmic gulfs. As the afternoon advanced, it became increasingly difficult to see, and we heard the rumble of a thunderstorm gathering over at this mountain. This sound is in such a locality naturally stirred us, though less than it would have done at night. As it was, we hoped desperately that the storm would last until well after dark, and with that hope turned from our aimless hillside searching towards the nearest inhabited hamlet to gather a body of squatters as helpers in the investigation. Timid as they were, a few of the younger men were sufficiently inspired by our protective leadership to promise such help. We had hardly more than turned, however, when there descended such a blonde sheet of torrential rain that shelter became imperative. The extreme, almost nocturnal darkness of the sky caused us to stumble sadly, but guided by the frequent flashes of lightning and by our minute knowledge of the hand, we soon reached the least porous cabin in Abuvala and heterogeneous combination of logs and boards whose still existing door and single tiny window both face Maple Hill. Barring the door after us against the fury of the wind and rain, we put in place the crude window shutter, which our frequent searches had taught us where to find. Where to find. It was dismal sitting there on rickety boxes in the pitchy darkness, but we smoked pipes and occasionally flashed our pocket lamps about. Now and then we could see the lightning through the cracks in the wall. The afternoon was so incredibly dark that each flash was extremely vivid. The stormy vigil reminded me shudderingly of my ghastly night on Tempest Mountain. My mind turned to that odd question which had kept reoccurring ever since the nightmare thing had happened. And again, I wondered why the demon approaching the three watchers, either from the window or the interior, had begun with the man on each side and left the middle man till the last when the titan fireball had scared it away. Why had it not taken its victims in 
a natural order with myself second from whichever direction it had approached. With that manner of far-reaching tentacles did it pray, or did it know that I was the leader and save me for a fate worse than that of my companions. Amid these reflections, as if dramatically arranged to intensify them, there fell nearby a terror, a terrific bolt of lightning, followed by the sound of sliding earth. At the same time, the wolfish wind rose to demoniac ascendos of ululation. We were sure that the lone tree on Maple Hill had been struck again, and Monroe rose from his box and went to the tiny window to ascertain the damage. And he took down the shutter with the wind and rain howled deafeningly, and so that I could not hear what he said, but I waited while he leaned out and tried to fathom nature's pandemonium. Gradually a calming of the wind and dispersal of the unusual darkness told of the storm's passing. I'd hoped it would last until the night to help her quest, but a furtive sunbeam from the knot hole behind me removed the likelihood of such a thing, suggesting to Monroe that we had better get some light even if more showers came. I unbarred the open and crude door. The ground outside was a singular mass of mud and pools, with fresh heaps of earth from the slight landslide. But I saw nothing to justify the interest which kept my companion silently leaning out the window, crossing to where he leaned. I touched his shoulder, but he did not move. Then, as I playfully shook him and turned him around, I felt the strang strangling tendrils of a cancerous horror whose roots reached into illuminatable past and fathomless abysmal of the night that Broods beyond time. Sir Arthur Monroe was dead, and on what remained of his chewed and gouged head, there was no longer face. This was brought to you by the Storyteller on YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast on any of these platforms. Anchor. Breaker. Overcast. Pocket Casts. Radio Public. Spotify. Support us on Patreon. And check us out on Discord. All the links can be found in the video description below. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed please like, subscribe, share, make comments. We love feedback.